All right, so when you assess a PD, uh, any chest X-ray for rotation, look at those clavicular heads, and you can see they do not line up to the left and right uh, symmetrically of the vertebral bodies. So clear rotation there. In addition, you can clearly see rib asymmetry here. And the other important thing to note about uh, X-rays, especially when they're rotated, is when you are gauging intercostal space widening, you need to use the posterior ribs. Even in a rotated patient, you can still get a sense of the intercostal spaces um, if you look at the posterior ribs. Once you start looking at anterior ribs, all bets are off, right? They're going to be all distorted and uh, bizarre looking sometimes, even in, in, especially in pediatric cases. So gauge ribs, inner space widening by looking at the posterior ribs. Okay, with all that said, you can see the right lung here is hyperlucent. So it is most likely expanded. Now, the other option is, could there be a layering left pleural effusion? Possibly, it's a supine film, usually because it's an infant, right? So then you wanna to go to the ribs and say, is there volume gain on one side or is there uh, volume gain on the darker side, which would suggest the pleural effusion, right? And you can see that if you look at the posterior interspaces, right, they are wider on the right. So you can conclude that there is hyperinflation of the right lung. All right, this is always mistaken for a snap and it's not, right? There's nothing else on this film to suggest that the patient's wearing a hospital gown or has EKG leads, right? There is no reason to think that that's a snap. It's sitting right over the hilum, right where an aspirated foreign body would go. So interesting thing about aspirated foreign bodies in pediatric patients is that you can either get hyperinflation distal to the aspirated body, or you can get atelectasis distal to the aspirated foreign body. And what that depends on is the nature of the aspirated foreign body. Is it inorganic? In which case you will usually get hyperinflation beyond that obstruction. And the reason is that the inorganic uh, aspirated foreign body is static in size and will not completely fill the bronchus during inspiration, right? When you typically have a widening of the bronchi. So uh, that results in a ball valve effect that causes hyperinflation of the involved lung. The opposite of that is when you aspirate an organic entity like a pinto bean, right? Or a hot dog, something like that. Organic aspirated bodies will swell. They are hydropic and they will gather water and swell to completely fill the bronchus and occlude it. In that case, you're going to get atelectasis on the involved side. Okay, so it can be really confusing. And if in doubt, right, the, the one thing you can always do too is uh, do uh, lateral films, decubitus films. Right, and put the uh, lucent lung down and see if it deflates, uh, which usually will mean it's the normal side. All right, so this one is an aspirated foreign body and has anybody figured out what it is that was aspirated? This is an earring backing. You can actually see, so there I'm noting the uh, difference in the posterior rib interspaces and the difference in the lucency of the lungs, right? With a hyperlucent, hyperexpanded right lung. But there is that backing, and look at that. You can see the naked earring post still in the patient's ear. So there you can see that is an earring backing. And you can even see that little groove in the post where that backing should be. So pretty great case. Uh, and I think the take home message here is <laughs> obviously don't get your infants ears pierced. All right, our next one. 
So this is always a fooler, and it's just really nice to see it, be introduced to it. Looking at it straight on, you would say that could easily be a mass, and it'll freak you out when the first time you see one of these. And, but if you look really closely, the edges of it are not real well circumscribed. And certainly it still could be a mass, but this is a, a famous fooler in pediatric x-ray. So when you look at the lateral, then you start to say, well, that is actually apparently conforming to the superior segment of the right lower lobe. Right, it's got a little more wedge shape to it. It's got more clearly defined superior and inferior borders. It really looks like it's sitting in the superior segment of the right lower lobe, and it is. So this is what's known as a round pneumonia. Clever title, right? But that's just how pneumonias can look in, in pediatric patients when they're in the superior segment like that. Let you look at that for a second. Uh, when I was showing this recently elsewhere, people said, oh, well, there may be pulmonary vascular prominence or congestion. And, uh, you know, in pediatric radiography, you really need to take the perihilar region with a grain of salt. As one of my old attendings used to say, these kids have snotty noses, snotty sleeves, and snotty hyla. And so uh, oftentimes the hyla look a little busier than you would like to see in an adult. And that's the case here. This patient did not have any pulmonary symptoms. Uh, so has anybody spotted it? This is a big one. And when you take your boards, look for this first in every pediatric film they show you. Right, which is, this is a rib fracture. There's a nice, it's a little more lateral than a typical abusive trauma. Oh, look at that, I haven't updated that name. They now call it abusive trauma, which I'm sure I've told you guys I love. I think that uh, calling it non-accidental trauma is kind of euphemistic, and we might as well call it what it is. Uh, so usually, these are a little more medial, in the posterior rib, that's the classic location. And of course, this comes from squeezing um, a crying baby. That's why they get rib fractures, right? So uh, of interest, I noted that uh, I was taking a CME course recently and they were calling out the specific criteria for alerting authorities. And we actually have a checkbox in our system, in our platform that allows you to just say, boom, alert the appropriate pediatric authority because it's different in every state uh, the particular official that you have to call an alert to this so anyway i was taking a cme course and i found it interesting that there was a comment in there that was basically any fracture in a child under one year of age and i i remembered that i had learned that in the past but it was a, an interesting reminder right if a child is not of ambulatory age is not able to walk the likelihood that they will get a fracture that's non-abusive is pretty low right so that's a good thing to go by and this one i i still remember it was uh, my best friend in private practice we were working together and he called me over and he said what about that and i said that is a healing rib fracture and uh, this was the boyfriend, as it almost always is, the mother's boyfriend. All right, that thymus looks crazy, but it's fine. Right? The thymus can be prominent in infants, and it can be a real nice sharp uh, outline like that. And that's perfectly normal. This triangle out here is not to be bothered with. All right, so what else do we have here, though? We have inappropriate placement of an NG tube. Note how it's looping here in the proximal esophagus. And so your immediate con concern should be that this is esophageal atresia. And when you make the diagnosis of esophageal atresia, the next place to look is the gastric bubble. Right? Because if you have complete atresia of the esophagus, there really should not be a gastric bubble unless you have an associated tracheoesophageal fistula, 
which is the case here, in which case you often have a rather hyperinflated gastric bubble, which is uh, this is kind of borderline, but it certainly is present, if not prominent, and that suggests then the final diagnosis of a tracheoesophageal fistula, right? Because those will, will form from the upper atretic esophagus and thus create a route by which gas can get into the stomach. So there is that NG tube and you can see the suction port right there. So you know exactly what that is that you're looking at. All right, so this one, uh, this is a great case, and this is a common phenomenon, and it's a, actually a, a fairly common presentation of a common disease. So the beauty of this is you can see there is atelectasis of the left upper lobe, and we've got the Lufsiegel sign, right, where the left lower lobe has inflated to fill that space left by the atelectatic left upper lobe. And this, uh, this can take some guts to call, right? You've got an edge here and not a line, but it probably is a pneumothorax. And actually, I know by virtue of the CT that it is, right? And that these always bother me with an atelectatic lobe to call a pneumo because it doesn't look all that prominent and it does not have that line, that plural line that you like to see when you call a pneumothorax, right? Again, this is an edge, and that's old time radiographer terminology, but when there's density up to a, an interface like that, you call it an edge, whereas when there's lucency on both sides, it's a line. Okay, so the other interesting thing on this is there's right middle lobe involvement as well. So this, when you have multifocal consolidation with potentially atelectasis and potentially a pneumothorax as well, that is acute asthma. Right? These patients get bronchial plugging, mucus plugging, and that results in atelectasis, which appears as obviously consolidation on an X-ray. Uh, it also can cause pneumothorax. Right? These patients will present with pneumothoraces because their work of breathing is such that they are struggling right, and creating a very negative pleural pressure, and that can pop any irregularity in the visceral pleura and result in a pneumo. So yeah, that is bothersome, but that is a pneumothorax. You should not see it that crisply. Right, And then there's the right middle lobe consolidation. Those will change too, by the way. I've ad admitted acute asthmatics where, you know, they had left upper lobe, right lower lobe kind of consolidation. And then you repeat the x-ray the next morning and it's reversed and it's involving entirely different areas of the lung. And that's, uh, that's very helpful, right? Then you absolutely know you're dealing with transient mucus plugging and asthma. All right, well, this is not a normal thymus. And it's outlined by gas. You can see there's more lucency here than in any of the aerated lungs, right? And this is thymus here, and here's another lobe of the thymus out here. Okay, that is too prominent, right? Compare it to the other thymus we were looking at. And it's lifted up and spread out laterally. Right, so that is the famous angel wings sign, and that is a pneumomediastinum. That's how they present on a supine infant chest. See, that's just too loosened. It's more loosened than any of the lungs that we otherwise can see. This is a great case because it's a twofer. Uh, you've got a right lung abnormality and a left lung abnormality, and there are different processes going on in each. So in the right lung, 
You've got a granular opacity that is verging on confluence. And so this is surfactant deficiency, whatever they're calling it these days. Uh, infant respiratory distress syndrome, or we used to call it hyaline membrane disease, right? But that granular appearance uh, throughout the lung, that's just classic uh, infant respiratory distress syndrome or uh, hyaline membrane disease. The patient is intubated, and in fact, uh, the, appropriately intubated, even though that does not line up beautifully, does it? And it, it is right to question that, and make sure that they know uh, that that tube is in fact in the trachea. But you can actually divine from this film that the tube is properly in the trachea because on the left, look at that those cystic appearing gas collections. This is pulmonary interstitial emphysema, and that is specifically a complication of mechanical ventilation. So this is a beautiful case in that you've got PIE on, in one lung and HMD in the other lung, uh, the PIE being a complication of the treatment for the infant respiratory distress syndrome. All right, so that, that only happens in uh, ventilated patients, and that is interstitial within the lung. So look at the difference there. You can see the granularity kind of looks like ground glass. When you look real closely, it almost looks uh, micronodular, or in this case, what it is is alveolar fluid, right? And then on the left lung, you've got those cystic gas collections, which as we know, are in the pulmonary interstitium. 